Let's talk suturing. I've been working in the ER now for, well, long enough that I call it the ER and not the ED, but about 20 years. And in that amount of time, I've done a ton of suturing on my own and precepted and watched a bunch of students. So PA students, NP students, medical students, residents, and I've realized things both in my own techniques that, hey, if I change this to this, it makes things more efficient. And I've seen common things that students do that I'm able to point out, hey, if you modify this technique, it will both make things easier and help alleviate some of the downstream effects that that technique is going to result in. So I wanted to put up a video on the top, in this case, 13 things that I've realized over the past 20 years related to suturing. This video is not going to be on specific suturing techniques themselves. I've done a few different videos on those already that I will link to in the show notes, but this is going to be more around just different concepts around the idea of wound care and suturing. Now, because it's a lot of topics, it is going to be a lengthy video. I will put some timed tabs down in the show notes. That way you can skip to specific portions of the video, or if you want to come back to look at it. If you're watching this video and either you're new or you've been doing this for a while and you see me do or say something and you say, that's dumb. There's a way better way to do that. By all means, post some stuff in the comments because that gets to tip number one that I'll get to in just a minute. For the suturing parts of this video, I'm going to use the Kenley Suture Pad. Looks like this. Some of you may have one. If not, I will put a link to it down below on Amazon. It's pretty affordable and it does a pretty good job with different types of wounds for replicating suturing. So let's get into it with tip number one. Number one is to always be available for learning new and different techniques. And this is true if you were a student and brand new at this stuff, or you've been out for 20 or 50 years. If you're new, you're likely to have a bunch of different preceptors that are doing things, especially with procedures and lacerations in a bunch of different ways. And for the most part, there are a ton of acceptable ways to get to the same correct end goal. There are some wrong things you can do. Like if you're doing a nerve block, you shouldn't stick the needle into the nerve. If you're doing an inferior alveolar block or a peritonsal or abscess, you shouldn't stick the needle into the carotid. Those would be wrong things to do, but for the most part, there are plenty of acceptable and not wrong ways to get to the same end goal. So watch everyone and then take the bits and pieces you like from everyone and make your own technique so that when you're out practicing, you can use that. Also, it's good to have different ways to do things because occasionally, especially with injuries and lacerations, your baseline technique may not be available because of the way the injury is or the anatomy. Quick example, I had a confused 90 year old lady with a clip on earring stuck on her little finger and it had been on there for three days, was good and stuck down in there. I couldn't do a traditional dorsal digital block because the earring was there. I couldn't do a flexor sheath block because the earring was there. I tried a Palmer block, which didn't work for some reason and ultimately did an ulnar nerve block, which got it numb and I was able to get the ring off. So it's good to have different techniques to get to the same goal. So to my point of what I said before, if you see me do something or say something and you say, hey, I think I have a better or a good alternative way to do that. Post some stuff in the comments, both for my benefit and for the benefit of people that are watching that can also come up with some different ways to do things. Point number two is safety. The gist here is that you don't want to leave the procedure with anything you didn't go into the procedure with. You don't want to leave with a new pain, a new injury, and most certainly not a new disease. For pain, patients will have injuries in the most difficult places to get to. You have to contort them into some weird way. You have to reach in some weird way. If it's a simple, small two, three stitch laceration, not that big a deal, you're in and out. But if it's a large complex laceration and you might be in there for an hour fixing it, both you and the patient have to endure that hour of time as comfortably as possible. So for both of you, get the patient into a comfortable position in the bed, maybe raise the head of the bed a little bit, move them over towards you, maybe sit down if you prefer, make sure the lighting is good, make sure the patient's warm, and even eat or drink a little something first and go to the bathroom first because you're going to be in there for a while. This way you don't leave the room with any extra back pain from being in some weird position or any more fatigue than you have to have because you've been in some weird position for the past hour trying to fix this laceration. You don't wanna risk an injury to fix the patient's laceration. For the most part, people are not going to die of their laceration. It's not like you're running into a burning building or you're pulling a patient out of a car that's going to explode. They'll have a little uglier scar, but they're not going to die of the laceration, it's okay. As they teach in the Wilderness First Responder course, the initial principle of evaluating the patient is remember, you're number one. So make sure that you're safe in this case. It's not worth getting injured to fix the patient. Amen. If you have the drunk, unruly patient, maybe they just need to sober up for a couple hours and then, hey, we'll come back and we can hopefully get this fixed then. If you have the psychiatric patient that's flailing around, they may need medicated and or restrained. And if you have the person that just gets super anxious every time you get near them with a needle and they jerk, you just get near them, they... I tell them, hey, look, I am more than happy to fix you, but I'm not going to risk getting injured if you can't hold still. 
is sometimes I'll sell it to the patient, especially if they have a laceration up around their eye. I'll say, hey, look, I need to put this numbing shot in there. You need to be careful not move because I don't want to stick you somewhere else that I didn't intend to. I don't want to accidentally stick you in your eye. And patients will usually buy into that. They don't want a needle in their eye. But if the patient ultimately just doesn't look like they can hold still, I flat out told them, hey, I don't feel comfortable fixing you. I've left the room. I had two patients say, hey, one guy said, hey, I just want to warn you. I tend to get kind of violent when people stick me with needles. All right, I guess we're not going to fix your laceration today. Another guy said, hey, when I was young, I was a bit of a rabble rouser, and I'm afraid if you stick me with that needle, I might haul off and punch you. Okay, I guess we're going to leave your thumb dislocated today. Again, it's not worth risking getting injured to fix the patient. Just, just don't do it. It's not worth it. And heaven forbid, you don't want to get stuck with the needle because that gets to my next point of not wanting to get a disease. Now, ideally, you know a disease the patient has before you go in to see them because it says in the chart that they have HIV or hepatitis C. And also, ideally, the patient tells you what they have because that's the right and the polite thing to do from their side. However, in the same way that you should treat every gun as if it's loaded, you should treat every patient, including the confused 90-year-old woman, as if they may have something because maybe the disease hasn't been diagnosed yet. Maybe they're from out of town and they failed to mention it to the triage nurse and also didn't tell you. So for that reason, you need to be careful with everyone, regardless of age or what you think they may or may not have. This is why I'm super liberal about putting a mask on for anything I think might even remotely squirt at me. Now, the problem with this is that it leaves your eyes exposed, so you could do a mask with glasses, but the problem I found with this is that the glasses can fog up. And so what I really prefer is the one-piece mask with face shield, and this generally works great as long as the bloody pus is coming from down near the patient. However, if, for instance, it's squirting at you from eye level from across the room, there is some chance it may miss the mask and hit you in the forehead, in which case, not so great. But as long as it's coming from the patient, it should be perfectly fine. Now, some things you can do to help avoid a needle stick. I see people when they're injecting the anesthetic in a similar way to when a nurse starts an IV, they will put their finger distal to where they're injecting to kind of hold the skin taut. Also, one of our PAs used to do digital blocks by holding the patient's finger inserting the needle dorsally, and when he felt the pressure on his finger, he would know he was in the right spot, deposit some anesthetic, and pull the needle back out. In both of these cases, it takes just a momentary reflexive jerk from the patient for the needle to go through their skin into your finger. So I am extra careful to not have any part of my body in front of where I'm injecting. Also, when you're loading the needle onto the needle driver, try and maintain good needle discipline by using instrument transfers from the needle onto the driver with the pickups onto the needle driver. Depending on the equipment you have, if you have big, huge pickups with big, huge teeth, this can be more challenging, but that's the safest way to do things. It's much easier to hold the needle in your finger. I'm guilty of it, but there is risk of getting stuck that way. As a side pearl, sometimes you get these drunk patients that are semi-conscious. You believe you've anesthetized the wound, and sometimes, and this is for a regular wound on a sober patient as well, you will stick the needle in just outside of the area that's anesthetized. And on the drunk patient, sometimes they will feel that and just reflexively jerk. If the needle's anywhere near your finger, you may stick yourself. Sometimes also the drunk people will just reflexively out of nowhere just wake up and jerk. And so another reason to not have the needle in your finger, especially when you're dealing with someone that is not fully invested and compliant with the procedure. And one other pearl on the risk of needle sticks and catching diseases, we get needle sticks and I always show the patients these numbers. It's at least a little reassuring. The risk of getting HIV from a known infected patient is 23 per 10,000 cases, or roughly 0.3%. Risk of hepatitis C is 1.8%. So that is to say, conversely, 99.7% of the time for HIV and 98.2% of the time for hepatitis C, you're not going to get the disease, but you still don't want the mental anguish and everything surrounding the needle stick, especially from a known dirty needle. So do everything you can to not stick yourself with a needle and not go home with any new diseases. We're ready to get the wound numb, so let's talk anesthetics. There is a lot of information in this section. I will try and be as succinct as I can with it. Anesthetics come in two big categories, topical and injectable. Topical things are going to be things like LET and TAC, and then there are also sprays and gels, sprays such as this Topex benzocaine spray, and gels such as hurricane gel. These sprays and gels work great on mucous membrane areas. So this Topex, just to show you, it comes with these little straws, usually comes with a bag of straws, kind of like WD-40. You put this in here, and this lets out a meter dose spray. So you hold it down one time, and it lets out a meter dose spray. Now this works great. Now this works great for mucous membranes, so great for intraoral things if you're going to do a dental block, 
I also learned one day that you could use this on a vagina. I had a girl with a vaginal abscess. She said, hey, don't you have anything topical? And I said, uh, mucous membrane. I talked to the pharmacist. They said, yeah, why not? And to make it a little bit better, it makes it smell like wild cherry. The hurricane gel, put a little bit on a cotton swab and just kind of brush it in there. It's amazing how little of that you actually need. Uh, I did learn that you do not want to put that in an open wound. I learned that the hard way one night. I had a two year old with an intraoral laceration. A lot of times you don't have to fix those. This one needed fixed. And based on how noisy the kid got after I put that gel in the wound, apparently not good. Sometimes you make up things on the spot. That night I had a popsicle and ice will get things numb. I held that popsicle on that kid's laceration, which that popsicle absolutely tastes better than the spray. And after I held it there for two minutes or so, I told the kid, hey, if you can let me put these two stitches in before this popsicle melts, you can have the rest of it. And worked great, two stitches, the kid didn't feel it, got the popsicle, everyone was happy. And then let and tack, which tend to come in both a liquid and a gel or ointment form, you are not likely going to have a choice of what you pick here. Your institution is going to have the let or the tack or whatever variation they have and the gel or the liquid. Anecdotally, I prefer the ointment form because I feel like you can really mash it down into the wound better. So I feel like it works better. Typically you put it on a two by two or a cotton swab. Some people swear by the cotton swabs, although I can't imagine there's much of a difference. Maybe it works better for the liquid, I don't know. Post some comments if you have a reason one way or the other. But you put it on one of them, you leave it on there on the wound, tape it there for 20 to 30 minutes. And if all goes well, it's pretty numb. A lot of times when you take it off, the skin will be blanched around the edges of it from the vasoconstrictor in whichever of the solutions you're using. Sometimes that's all you need and sometimes you need to augment it with a little bit of injectable stuff. Sometimes I will bring in a little 3cc syringe of some lidocaine with a small gauge needle and augment it a little bit if need be. The let and the tack and those type of things work great on vascular areas. So it works great on the face, but not as well on less vascular areas like a forearm or a thigh. I saw someone try it on a finger laceration once. Shockingly did not have much of an effect, but sometimes you might get lucky and it will not work on intact skin. Next section is the injectable anesthetics. This is also kind of a big section with some numbers. I'm gonna talk some facts at the beginning, some opinions at the end. Most hospitals will stock typically lidocaine, also called xylocaine, or bupivacaine, also called marcaine. Our hospital also now stocking ropivacaine as apparently we have a bupivacaine shortage. There are some other options, but most hospitals I've been to have the lidocaine and bupivacaine. Both of these come in a plain and with epinephrine version, and both of these typically come in two different concentrations. The lidocaine comes in a one and a 2%, and the bupivacaine comes in a 0.25 and 0.5%. Now, when should you use the different concentrations? There are maximum dosages for each of these before you start getting increased likelihood of systemic side effects. As with any other drug, less is more. If you can use less drug and less potential side effects, all the better. I have never seen, and I've spoken to pharmacists about this as well, I've never seen a difference in the anesthesia result that you get from twice the concentration. So if you can get by with the lesser concentration, you'll be less likely to have side effects. I recommend going with that. If you've seen different, post some comments, but that's been my experience. And every so often when I would get a large laceration, I would say, let me stop and calculate the dose just to be safe. And each time I realized I was nowhere near for the most part close to maximum dosages. And finally, I calculated them enough. I just put them in a Google document so I could refer to it every so often. I'll put these numbers down in the show notes if you want to copy them and paste them into a Google document on your own. I calculated these for a typical 150 pound, 70 kilogram person, just to give you roundabout numbers. Also in this Google document for the heck of it while I'm in here, I put in some basic absorption times of some of the absorbable sutures. I'll throw that in the show notes as well. So the plain versus with epinephrine. The epinephrine is a vasoconstrictor. It's going to therefore keep the drug in the area longer to give a longer duration of the anesthesia. And also because it's keeping it there, it is less likely to give you systemic side effects until you get to a larger dose. So talking about the general maximum dosages, plain 1% lidocaine, 28 cc's, 2% lidocaine would thus be half of that, it's twice as strong, and that would be 14 cc's maximum dose. If you add the epinephrine, that goes up to 49 cc's and 25 cc's. If you have a laceration that's getting up towards 50 cc's of an anesthetic, I don't know, maybe that ought to go to the OR, that's a pretty big laceration. The bupivacaine, because the dosages were similar, 2 to 2.5 milligrams per kilogram and 2.5 to 3, plain versus with epi, 
I am just using the plain because that still gives you 28 cc's of the 0.5% and 56 cc's of the 0.25%. Again, if you're getting towards 50 cc's, um, that's pretty big laceration. Now, when to use plain versus with the epinephrine. If you remember from school, we all learned the phrase fingers, nose, penis, and toes, with the idea of that being that you don't want to cut off proximal blood flow because all the tissue distal to that will essentially necrose. Without going too much into the weeds of this, for the most part, it's all bogus. Look up all the studies. It started all the way back in 1928, and they found that it really just doesn't matter. It doesn't cut off enough blood supply to make a difference. I suppose if you are more of a vasculopath and you have something like Berger's disease or you're more diabetic, then maybe you would be a little increased risk for some vascular issues, but for the most part, it's not the big thing they teach you in school. For me, it's still standard of care to not use it. I have accidentally used it a few times, but it's not the big scary death that we were taught in school. Look up the studies and you'll see. Now some opinion on what drugs to use when, lidocaine versus bupivacaine with or without epi. Here's another area, post some comments, let me know what you think of these thoughts here. This is my thoughts, your mileage may vary. For me, plain lidocaine, I think should be banned from the earth. I think this drug by itself is 90% worthless, maybe even 95% worthless because you get an hour length duration of use out of this. And for the most part, if you're fixing an injury, you want it to be numb longer for pain control. Especially if you're doing a digital blocks, by God, never use this in a digital block because you do the digital blocks and you tell the patient, hey, I'll give that five or 10 minutes to, to set in and I'll come back. Sometimes it's not busy, you get back in 10 minutes, but sometimes that 10 minutes is an hour because you're working in the ER and it's busy. And now you are an hour into that hour of duration and now they're not numb anymore. I saw someone do three fingers worth of digital blocks with this, and then suddenly all three fingers were now not numb, had to reblock them with a real drug. If there's some small procedure where you truly only needed to be numb briefly because maybe you need to like dig an dermal piercing out of someone, okay, and they're gonna, it's not gonna hurt after you get it out, okay, maybe. That's fine. Some people have the theory of mixing the lidocaine with, I'll say this is bupivacaine, for the quick acting, long lasting. I think the return on investment for that is not worth it because the time of onset is effectively almost exactly the same. It's both one to two minutes. Pretty much you could inject them into someone and then you sit there and you wait and while you're sitting there a minute later, both of them are numb in the same length of time. So I don't think it's worth taking the time to mix them because you're not getting any faster time of onset and you're still getting the same actually slightly less because you're diluting it with the lidocaine a little bit, but slightly less duration of the anesthetic. You can also buffer them with bicarb, the theory being that these are acidic, and if you buffer them, they become a little bit closer to the pH of the skin, and they burn less going in. If you're going to buffer it, lidocaine is a one in 10 dilution, so that's one of bicarb and nine of lidocaine. I've seen studies both ways that say helps, doesn't help. I do it like two, three times a year, if that. The bupivacaine, if you're going to do that, 0.2 in 10, 0.2 of bicarb, and 9.8 of the bupivacaine, I never do that. If you do one in 10 of the bupivacaine, it very quickly takes you back to freshman chemistry. You end up with this big precipitate and the syringe, and you quickly realize you screwed something up. The next step is to figure out what size needles and syringes we need to use. Quick thing before I get into this on how to open these, this saves you one to two seconds, but I swear it will feel like it saves you about an hour. The classic way to open them is to peel them open like this, right? That's fine, you can do that that way. But a slightly quicker by two second way to open it. There we go, and now it's open. Same with the needles, and if you want to keep it sterile, you can even keep it like that. Saves, like I said, just a small amount of time, but I swear it will feel like it'll save you half your shift. Now what size should we use of all these? The gist of the principle here is that smaller in each case is going to be easier to control and less painful for the patient. If you have, let's bring in the laceration pad here, if you're going to fix this, that's going to take, that's maybe centimeter, centimeter and a half long, and that might take one, maybe one and a half cc's of an anesthetic. If you're going to try and control one cc out of this 10 cc syringe, it's a lot harder to be precise with how much you're injecting. You can do it, but it's a lot harder than, say, if you drew it up in this three cc syringe, and you drop two cc's in that, or one cc in that, and then you can be a lot more precise with how much you're injecting in there. 
Now looking at needle size, the sizes that I have here, 18 gauge, 25 gauge, 27 gauge, and 30 gauge. And a lot of these will come in different sizes, but this just gives you a relative idea of the size of the gauge of needle. When you're injecting someone with the anesthetic, the anesthetic, as I mentioned, is acidic and it tends to burn going in. And one of the things you can do to make that burn less is to inject it slower. And if you use a smaller gauge needle, because the needle is smaller, you can't force the anesthetic through it as fast as you can through a large gauge needle. And because of that, it's going to go in slower and it's going to burn less. And also, if you had to have a choice of having a needle stuck in you, would you want a big needle stuck in you or a small needle stuck in you? It's less scary to patients when you get the small needle out. Sometimes I'll even say to patients about the 30 gauge, yeah, this is the smallest needle we have for the more anxious patients. I have looked up studies on needle pain and size, and the only studies I could find were all dental studies that showed that patients couldn't tell a difference between 25, 27, and 30. And so for that reason, I have started using 25 gauge needles for my dental blocks. For big, long lacerations, especially on the leg, I'll get the inch and a half 25 gauge needle. And then for arms and faces, things that are a little bit smaller, I'll use the 27 or even the 30 gauge because you get nice control over this. On recapping needles, ideally you should not do that because you run a risk of sticking yourself. A lot of needles now, so that you don't have to recap them, have this little safety device on them where you can just push it and lock it shut and then it is locked that way so you can't get stuck. But occasionally maybe you've used some of the anesthetic and you want to save some for later just in case. So if you're going to recap a needle, the way I recommend is to not take it and do it this way. Because you run the risk of either slipping or getting startled or any number of reasons where it can happen. And instead of the hole here, you miss and you stick yourself in the finger. So if you're going to recap it, I recommend laying the cap down, putting the needle in, kind of picking the cap up, and then grabbing the cap from the proximal end of the needle. A lot of times I will bend a needle to use, which I'll show you in a little bit. One of our nurse practitioners was recapping a bent needle and she held the cap from up here. And somehow the bent needle pierced through the sheath here and went into her finger as she was holding it right here. And then she had a needle stick. So if you're going to recap it, do it this way. And then when you grab the cap, grab it from back here so that if by some chance the needle does go through the sheath, you're not going to stick yourself with it. Getting ready to inject, of note with the anesthetic vials, there are some that are single dose and some that are multiple dose. The difference being that the multiple dose ones have an antimicrobial preservative in them to help retard the growth of bacteria. It does not affect viruses, however. There are a lot of places, including our hospital, that is making everything single dose. So even though this is a multiple dose vial, we use it for one patient and then we throw it out. So we need to draw some lidocaine out of the vial. Use a large bore needle, like an 18 gauge, also, some places will have a blunt tip needle, which are usually red. Please do not stick the blunt tip needle into a patient. I've seen it done. It's not kind to the patient because it does not go in kindly because it's, well, it's not sharp. So either one of these is fine, but you want to use a large bore because if you try and suck lidocaine out through a 30 gauge needle, you're going to be there for a while. Now, when you go to get it out, you want to put a little bit of air in the syringe, stick the needle into the bottle, inject the air into the syringe, this creates some back pressure in the syringe so that you can then draw the anesthetic out. If you're going to draw just one cc out, not a big deal, but if you're going to draw up 10 cc's of an anesthetic without injecting some air into it to create some pressure, as you're sucking it in, you're creating a vacuum in that bottle and it gets progressively harder to get it out. So always inject a little bit of air into the vial first and that will make it a lot easier to get the lidocaine out into the syringe. And then take it, lock up the needle. The needle is now safe. This, once it's like that, it will not come out. It's safe and that will protect them, and then you can throw it out. So we're going to get this wound numb. There's two ways that you can inject the anesthetic. You can go through the skin surface like this, or you can go sub-Q into the wound this way. There are a lot more nerve endings on the skin surface, so going through the skin surface is about twice as painful as it is going into the wound. The idea of going in the wound freaks patients out. I explained to them that it's about half as painful. I will usually offer to do it their way through the skin surface, but in 20 years, not a single person has taken me up on that offer. Now, this is a pretty long wound and you need to get the whole length of it numb. So what you don't want to do is inject here and push them in. Go here, inject some, here, inject some, because if you do this through the whole length of the wound, by the time you do both sides, that might be 10 or 15 sticks. So what you want to do is start at one end, stick the needle in, and inject longitudinally along the wound. Now to make that easier, the needle is straight here. I find the bevel, and I bend it up about 
10, 15 degrees, just a little bit like that. And what that does is it makes it a lot easier for you to hold the needle parallel under the skin surface while holding the syringe just a little bit angled above it. Otherwise, if it's all flat, you just can't get it in there as well. So you start at one end, deposit a little bit there, and then as you're going forward, inject. You want to have a little bit of anesthetic ahead of the needle. Even though it makes sense that the anesthetic takes 30 to 60 seconds to actually work, studies have shown that if you have the anesthetic ahead of the needle, that it sort of freezes the tissue, as it were, and in general, it makes the procedure less painful having it ahead of the needle. I see some people that will stick the needle all the way in and then inject as they're pulling out, but ideally you want to have some anesthetic ahead of the needle. So you inject, you get it numb to about here, and then you take the needle out, you go through an area that is already numb, you now inject down to about here, go through an area that's already numb, and inject the rest of it. So three sticks, and ideally they only feel the first one because the other two areas that you're going through are already numb, and then same thing for both sides. I'll give it a minute, and then I'll just usually check it. Hey, can you feel this? Can you feel this? If they feel a spot there, yeah, I feel that. And I'll say, is it sharp or just pressure? Because if it's just pressure, then it's no big deal, and they're just feeling the equivalent of you pushing it with your finger. But sharp, okay. Let me inject a little bit more there. That spot may have missed a little bit. Put a little bit more in there. I've also found that sometimes if I'm resting my hand back here as I'm checking it, can you feel this? And they'll say yes, but what they're feeling is my hand. So be careful of that. Now you can do this anesthesia locally, as I just discussed, or in certain places of the body, a better option is going to be a nerve block. Nerve blocks in many cases can provide better pain relief with less medication for a longer amount of time and far less, usually just one needle stick. Good example is fingertip injuries. I've seen a ton of fingertip injuries where they've just been given repeated doses of morphine, fentanyl, Dilaudid, and it really doesn't control the pain all that well when all they really needed was three to five cc's of bupivacaine and in many cases, they'll be numb until tomorrow. Works so much better. There's also a few parts of the body that are going to be super sensitive with getting stuck with the needle. Lips are a good example, and tips of fingers are a good example. Also, there are certain places where injecting a lot of anesthetic is going to distort the tissue because it's going to expand the tissue. It'll get reabsorbed, but still, it's expanded and can make it a little bit harder to fix initially. Also, certain places where injecting epinephrine is going to distort the tissue. A good example of that is the vermilion border. If you inject lidocaine with epi into a lip, it may blanch that border, and when you're trying to line it up, it may be hard to see right where the edges are, and you may offset it a little bit and not get a perfect repair. Also, if you have a large laceration, if you're fixing this thing, but it's on your forehead, and it's this big, you could inject this whole area like I just showed, a bunch of sticks, or you could do one nerve block and get the whole area. The face is a treasure trove of areas for nerve blocks. Superorbital, infraorbital, inferior alveolar, mental, auricular, plenty of options. And then also the digital nerve blocks that I just discussed. You can do wrist blocks. And if you want to get really adventurous, you can try ankle blocks, which I've never succeeded at, but it's an option. Now, the caveat with nerve blocks is that you want to be careful not to stick the needle into the nerve, both because it's super painful and also because you can injure the nerve. Next point, and this is a big one, always perform and document any applicable exam that is related to the injury and always consider and obtain any applicable imaging related to the procedure or the imaging. If you are a resident or a PA, an NP, a medical student, and someone is giving you this procedure, the attending has seen the patient and they're saying, hey, can you go fix this wound? And as you understand it, your job is just to bring the skin back together and that's all you do, you're going to get burned and you're going to get yourself in trouble. Even if you're an attending and another attending has given you the patient or a fellow resident, PA, or you're getting the patient from an outside hospital and you think that your job is just to close the skin, you're going to get yourself in trouble. I have been burned and nearly burned by this several times. Early on in my career, the doc said, hey, can you go fix this person's neck? Sure, no problem. I sew up the neck only to realize the next day that I had sewn a bunch of glass into this guy's neck. I had assumed that the doctor had considered everything appropriate as related to this injury and I was just to close the skin. So always see the patient, repeat an exam. This is especially true for hands with tendon and nerve injuries. I always repeat the exam and document the exam because you also want to show that any injury was there if they have some nerve deficit or a tendon injury, that that was there before you go mucking around in their finger. Always consider the mechanism of injury and consider what type of imaging may be necessary to it. If they put some part of their body through a glass window, as was the case with the neck guy, Say to the person, hey, did you get an x-ray of this? You didn't. I'm going to get an x-ray of this to make sure there's nothing in there. 
always sort of be your own person seeing this procedure. As Reagan said, trust but verify. It's not that they maybe didn't do the exam, but you can't assume that they did the appropriate exam. So always consider everything related to the injury on your own and document that. Because otherwise you're going to get in trouble. And related to this, when you're performing the repair of the laceration, you need to look for any deep injuries. On scalps, you need to look for galial injuries. And especially true on hands, you need to look at the wound and the position of injury. If someone punched a window and cut their tendon, when they extend their finger, that tendon laceration now moves up to here. And you can look in the wound down here, but the laceration of the tendon is now up here. So you need to say, what position was your hand or your finger in when you did this injury? And if they say, I was in a clenched fist, I will hold the wound open and either ask them to or do myself slowly bend the finger. And a lot of times that tendon laceration will come back into view and you can repair it or know that it needs to be referred to a hand surgeon for repair. So always consider the mechanism of injury, how the patient was when they injured it, and everything surrounded with this. And related to imaging, I will not drain anything that I think might be a drug abscess without getting an x-ray because I have seen numerous times where a needle has broken off in a patient and I do not want to be pushing on that patient's skin trying to squeeze the abscess only to have that needle come through their skin into my finger. So always consider everything surrounding the injury when you're seeing a patient when someone else has already seen them. That way you provide the best care for the patient by not missing any injuries and you don't cause yourself any down the road hassle by both having to either go back and fix something later or medical legally because you blew past the injury that they had because you didn't do the appropriate exam. Next point is to be sure to use the right suture for the right wounds. I'm not going to go into an in-depth discussion on what to use for what because there are a ton of options, both absorbable and non-absorbable. We were once taught that you shouldn't use absorbable on the surface, especially the face because of increased scarring, but studies seem to have shown that that's gone by the wayside and you can now use that and there's no change in the scar. Get to the idea of ballpark sizes that you should use for what parts of the body, 6-0 for the face, 5-0 for the finger, 4-0-5-0 for arms and legs, things like that. There's a good table on the Wiki EM page I'll put right here and I will also put a link to down in the description. You can check out lots of good information there. I saw a resident suturing a finger laceration once, a little through and through on a finger. And I walked in to see how he was doing. And I was like, oh, 2 0 Vicryl. I might have used something a little smaller and nylonier, but probably realistically in the end, that 2 0 Vicryl would not absorb it a week. You cut it out and it'd be okay. But the needle on that thing, it's like this big. So educate yourself on proper stuff to use for the right wounds. Next, I briefly wanted to talk about the needle driver, which is not to be confused with the hemostats that are also in most suture kits. This may be old news for most of you, but just a brief talk here for some of the newer folks. The differences between the two of these briefly are that the needle driver typically has a shorter tip to it and does not have teeth. It's a smooth surface in here, whereas the hemostats have a longer tip, are usually a little bit thinner, and they have teeth. Now, while the needle driver can function as hemostats, and the hemostats can function as a needle driver. Neither of them does the opposite wonderfully. They both do it adequately. The hemostats are nice for getting in and separating tissue to have a look down in there. You can do that with the needle driver, but they tend to be a little bit bigger. And because the tip is shorter, you have to spread your fingers apart farther in order to get that tissue separated the same amount. When you go to suture, you can use the hemostats as a needle driver. But the problem is that for smaller needles like 4050, because of the teeth, it can sometimes get in there at some weird angle instead of just a straight perpendicular, and it just makes it harder to sew. Whereas the needle driver itself, because it is just flat, will almost always hold the needle nice and even and perpendicular. Next, let me talk about how to hold the needle driver. Back at this end, there are these two round things that may even be called finger holes. I don't know the official name, but they may be called finger holes and although there are differing thoughts on this, dare I say that everyone else that does not feel what I'm about to say is wrong. And that is that the finger holes are not for putting your fingers in when you're suturing. You can open and close it with it, that's fine. But when you are suturing, you do not want your fingers in these holes. And if you can unlearn that technique early or just never learn it, that will do much better for you. So the right way to hold the needle driver is that you put your index finger roughly on the pivot point there, and the rest of it just gets palmed. And when you go to put the stitches in, you do this twisting motion. The problem 
when you put your fingers in the holes is that you will occasionally get into some weird positions for suturing, some funky position with the way the patient is. And when you're trying to do this same twisting motion, you don't have nearly the control with your fingers in the holes as you do like this. And even just little fine controls you can do. And sometimes you get in these weird positions and instead of doing your whole hand, you do this little twist of your fingers even in combination with a little wrist flip. So it is so much easier, so much more fine control palming it with your finger here as opposed to putting your fingers in the holes. Do your best not to learn with your fingers in the holes. If you're fancy, you don't have to ever put your fingers in the holes because depending on the quality of your equipment, you can open it by pushing it with your thinner eminence, grab the needle, and then close it by squeezing it, open it. And for that matter, you, you don't ever need to use the finger holes. I use the finger holes to open and close it to grip things and then promptly take them out to grab the needle. Now let's talk about holding the needle with the needle driver. When you open your suture packet, the needle is placed perfectly to grab it about a third of the way down and pull it out. Now things that you don't want to do, as I mentioned before, is you don't want to hold the needle in your finger to load the needle driver, especially with the smaller needles, 5.0, especially 6.0, because your finger will cover the whole tip of the needle and it takes just a little bit for the patient to jerk and you stick yourself. So ideally, if you can, when you're taking the needle out of patients, you want to hold it with the pickups and then do instrument transfers that way. Now, when you grip the needle with the needle driver, you want to grip it about a third of the way down the needle out towards the tip of the needle driver and perpendicular to the edge of the needle driver. What can happen is if you sometimes grab it at a 45 degree angle like this, it just, you get the muscle memory normal from doing these straight perpendicular twists. And if you grab it at a 45 degree angle, it's just going to be different from the way you're used to doing things. Sometimes you will grab it in different ways because of the way the laceration is, and you intentionally will do it that way. But for the most part, third of the way down and perpendicular to the tip of the needle. What can happen with some of the smaller needles, like the 5.0 and 6.0, and I learned this the hard way, if you grip it way back here at the tip, the needle will eventually bend. The needle will bend out, and you'll take it and you'll bend it back and it'll keep bending out. And then once it bends, you're just done for. You need to get a new needle. So always, especially on these smaller needles, grab it a third of the way down and right out at the tip of the needle driver. Now let me talk about some aspects of actually putting the stitches in. I'm not going to go into a bunch of suturing techniques here. That's way too far out for the point of this video. And there's a bunch of other resources for that. If people are interested in certain techniques and you want me to put up a video of those, let me know, post some stuff in the comments and maybe I can do that. But let me just talk about some other points along with the suturing itself. When you go to put the stitch in, ideally you want the stitch to be roughly perpendicular to the skin edge. Push it through, again, you do that twisting motion and you want it to come up roughly equidistant on both sides of the wound. Push it through and then grab it and pull it out. Now things to not do is that you don't want to leave a ton of tail over here both because it then wastes all this extra suture. And when you go to tie it, if you have all the suture on both ends, it just gets too confusing with what's what and what you're trying to grab and what you're trying to tie. So pull it through so there is just a little bit of a tail, maybe inch and a half or so left. And then when you go to grab the other end to tie it, don't grab it way up here because that same way, you just get all twisted and it's hard to tell what you're grabbing. So grab down near the wound, maybe again, just a few inches. That way you can twist around a lot easier, grab it, and you can tie the knot a lot easier. And you can bring it together. Next point here when you're suturing is that you want to take large bites. I learned this the hard way when people finally started coming back to the ER to get their stitches taken out. If you fix a wound, especially with smaller sutures, and you do these little micro bites, as I like to call them, just real close to the wound edges, and we'll see how it works on this thing. Tie your knot. And you've got something like this. You can barely see the suture right here. You can barely see where that knot is. And maybe you run this down the whole length or you do a bunch of interrupted. The problem is that patients, I don't know about where you are, our patients don't take care of their wounds. Instead of coming back in one week, they might come back in three weeks and instead of keeping it nice and clean, it will come back all crusted over. So if you do these little microbites, the length of the wound, 
you're going to have to dig them out because they're going to be hard to get to. They're going to be all encrusted and the skin is going to be grown over them. And it's going to be painful for the patient because you're digging them out with the iris scissors or the scalpel, whatever you're using. And painful for you because of that same thing. You're trying to dig them out. So what I have found is that if you take much more larger bites, the, the cosmetic appearance of the wound is going to be no different. But when you go to take these stitches out... You can see here how much more suture you have to work with to get under there and cut the stitch. And then when you go to trim them, people like different length tails. I like to leave, you know, a centimeter or so. That way it does give someone something to grab onto when they come back to try and get them out if need be. Now when you put the stitches in, be careful not to pull them so tight that you strangulate the tissue. Really, you just need to get the wound edges back together with a reasonable amount of tension, and the body is happy to take care of the rest. As you can see here in this video of my arm, which I'll put a link to the whole video up above, you can check out this suture removal video that I did. These stitches were put in really tight. They were only in for a week. I kept it very clean, as you can see here. And when we tried to take them out, it was really unpleasant for me because it was painful because they were so dug in there. And it was difficult for the person doing it because they were so dug in there that it was hard to get to. Also, when you're putting the stitches in, as I mentioned about those little micro bites that I talk about, sometimes if you do these fine little bites in a running suture, it looks really pretty for the five days that they're in. But again, when you go to take them out, it can be really unpleasant for the patient, especially if they've not kept it clean. So there's no need to do super small bites, do reasonable size bites, and it'll be great in the end. Next tip is knowing what parts of the body you can and probably should not revise and trim wound edges. If you have a patient that falls onto a razor blade or cuts himself with a razor blade, something where you get a nice straight edge, something like this, and you have that on the forehead or wherever else, so that app is going to come out nice and pretty with nice straight wound edges. However, you get these people that fall onto some rocky, jagged, gravelly surface, and they get these ugly, stellate, flappy, jagged edge lacerations. And if you just sew that back together as is, it is not going to be very cosmetically appealing. So there are some places on the body where you can and should trim those wound edges into something more resembling an ellipse, something in this ballpark, because that's going to come back together much better than those ugly, jagged flap edges. So be aware of what areas on the body you can, and again, probably should not do that with. The face has a lot of extra skin, and you can trim a face pretty liberally. A forehead has a lot of extra skin, cheeks, lips, although the super pain with the lip is if you trim in just the wrong place, that thing will start bleeding, and oh my God, you're there forever holding some pressure on that thing, waiting for it to stop bleeding. I hate lips. But there's a lot of extra skin on the lip if need be to trim it. Arms, especially forearms, have a lot of extra skin. One note on forearms is that I learned this the hard way my first year practicing, is that forearm skin is notorious for rolling under itself. And if you sew two skin surfaces together, where you go to take those stitches out, it's all going to come unraveled. And for that reason, I would almost always do a mattress or even better, my most favorite suture ever, the running horizontal mattress suture. If you don't know it, learn it, be it, love it. It's awesome. Check it out. Great for forearms and a bunch of other places, but I digress. Point though being that there is a fair amount of extra tissue on a forearm or maybe on a thigh, but not on the extensor surface of a finger because you're going to try and bend it and it's going to be hard because you've taken some of that tissue away and most definitely not on the shin, and especially not on the shin of an 80-year-old woman where there is not any tissue to start with. So just be aware of what areas you can and cannot. When you first do it, it's going to be very foreign and kind of scary to you because you're going to say to yourself, I should not cut all this tissue away because, well, it's on their body. I, I shouldn't get rid of it, right? But once you be comfortable doing this, you will realize how much better of a cosmetic outcome it is for the patient when you can trim the wound edges into a nice, clean ellipse and bring those back together so much nicer. And lucky number 13 is to familiarize yourself with Dermabond. I've already done an entirely separate video on this, which I will put a link to up here. You can check that out. But to briefly cover it here, Dermabond is great on wounds where there is not much tension. Wounds where you can just gently push them together, such as on a face. Lots of opportunities for that on faces, and it works great on kids on faces because it is not the scary needle. It does burn a little bit about 30 seconds in because it's an exothermic reaction as it dries. So it burns, but it's pretty brief and way better tolerated than needle. You need to make sure the wound is bloodless because it won't stick if it's bleeding. You don't want to put it over a wound that might get infected, such as a bite wound, because it's going to seal all that bacteria in there, making an infection more likely. 
you don't want to put it over a joint because the dermabond is not flexible. So when you try and flex that joint and it's back here, it may pop open and less useful over a high friction area, such as the radial aspect of an index finger where there's gonna be a lot of touching and it may wear off quicker. So there's your tips, but before I go, I have a bonus tip. And this tip is more in the art of medicine as opposed to the science of medicine as it relates to lacerations. And this has to do with bacitracin. Now, if you've been sewing a laceration for the past half hour or an hour, and especially if there are visitors at the bedside, by the time you get to the end of it, they have likely stopped paying attention like they were at the beginning. They're probably back on their phone, they're watching TV, but they're not really paying attention. As soon as you announce to the room that you're done, everyone will stop what they are doing and they will converge on that laceration because they wanna see what kind of work that you've done. Now, as much as the work that you've done is unchanged, that laceration will appear nicer with a little shiny coat of bacitracin on it. So for that reason, I don't announce that I'm done to the room until I've taken a little layer of bacitracin and just kind of smoothed it on there. It doesn't have to be a lot, just a little shiny coat and the laceration will now appear nicer. Before I take the drape off, because that's also a sign that you're done, I'll put some on, I'll take the drape off and then I'll say, okay, all done. At that point, everyone will get up and they'll look and they'll say, wow, that looks really nice. That's gorgeous. Wow, you never even know there was a hole there. I'm going to cut myself tomorrow so I can come back and have you fix me. Can I have a comment card? Again, it just looks, don't I look prettier, right? It'll look a little nicer with a little bass trace on there. Nothing for the wound initially. It will help with the wound healed down the road. That's a separate issue. But again, art of medicine, little bass trace on the wound will help it look a little bit nicer when everyone gets up to look at it. So there you go, 13 tips and a bonus and some pearls on suturing. Post some comments down below on things that you have realized people could do to improve their suturing skills and maybe some other comments on some other medical videos you might like to see me do. If you made it this far, I appreciate you watching and I hope the video was helpful for you.